This Book, This Moonless Sky, by Mark Rogerson, known on this planet as Marik Rogerson. It starts with a short dedication in our local Zdianans language. I'll just read it for you, so you can see what that language sounds like. The dedication starts by thanking my friends, and my mentors, my late parents, and it ends up with a God bless. Viadsten, thanks. Viadsten Gaumen, ten sixen mils, primaser chanj mils. Viadsten metet deja, ten weilen archenin mils, etenemet viadstemet im mahalam Part 1 Becoming Alien the Hard Way. Hi, welcome. First, a sidetrack. I made a lot of notes for this book while I was living through the events it describes. At one point, I thought the best note pages were lost forever, but a heroic young woman returned them to me at great peril to her life and mine. They had a dingy memo clipped to the front page with skillfully calligraphed handwriting in black ink, followed by a masted battleship of a signature. Translated word for word from the harsh-sounding down language of the country we were in, the memo said this. This decrepit screed was seized from one of the plaguish vorticates in our work mob, the one who consorts with the filthy so-called alien male mall. It's incomprehensible, worthless to us, maybe idiot-level espionage, incinerated utterly, and attached two more sets of rings to his arms. Monitor him at level six, and ensure he has no further chance to violate our perfect values. Signed. And Vang. This memo is now a survival talisman for me, a memento. I've always kept it attached at the front of my best paper copy of my notes or my manuscript. I'm used to seeing it here, so now it's also in the book. The rest begins at the beginning, as I'd originally planned it. Ringtum District. That's the name of the geographic location we start at. I raised my face up and swung my arms up over my head, putting my hands together at the fingertips like a diver about to plunge. Eolach! I shouted, which means upwards. A few other people did the same. On the other side of a descending dust cloud, six metallic contraptions, diverse in form, emitted the same greeting. Bits and pieces of their frames pointed at the sky. The landing craft behind them also pointed back up at the sky it would soon return to. The sky was blue and spotless. The tiniest of winds circulated round my neck and ears. The ocean splashed in the distance, as if a very small child was playing in it. I was amazed. What stood before me was the same lander that had brought me here almost two years ago. That's this planet's years, mind you. Not exactly the same as Earth years, although close. In any case, the landing party should have been gone a long ways out into the solar system by now. Since when did communicators circle around in one cosmic spot, like interplanetary dust particles? They usually moved on. They had a long way to go. There was a large crowd of onlookers, but most of them had never seen the communicator salute before, and only the old-timers and leaders had responded to it. Upwards, the salute was the old mobilizing cry from the eons ago when the space-born nomads had first left their original planet and set out through the darkness. Now the communicators resorted to a more conventional greeting. said one of the metallics, using some sort of amplification. Penan diat. These two expressions were just simply hello in the communicator language and the local language. Extraplanetary and human. The two species if you could still call the metallics a species, were old friends. I was the only one in the crowd who'd lived with these metallics and had known them as family. I knew them better than anyone. Nonetheless, the chief local dignitary here emerged out of our human mob and got the first shot at a close-up face-to-metal greeting. Heyo kamakamishtse, which means friends and communicator ease. What brings you back? Did you forget something? He waved a parasol as if that might be the thing they'd left behind. 
A laugh rippled through the crowd. The metallics glowed red and said, Oh, which was a sort of light applause. They didn't laugh per se, but they appreciated humor. We couldn't resist taking one more look at such a beautiful Aenopicon, said a metallic, using the local dignitary's formal title. It referred to something like a constitutional monarch, a head of state, but in this case not hereditary. Dea, the monarch in question, was forty-something, tall, clean-shaven, and not especially handsome. But the two species bantered like old buddies when they got together. It was the custom. I don't believe a word of it, but make yourself at home. Our planet is your mat, Dea said. This was his first formality. A mat is a little chunk of land, and everyone in the country is given one to own. Most people don't put it to any practical use and situate it someplace beautiful, where they can go and enjoy it during their time off. It is sacrosanct, and it's theirs as long as they live. God forbid that they should ever lose their home in a catastrophe of some kind, but if they do, they can take refuge on their mat. My best friend, Xasaron, was the only person I knew of who'd actually ever done that, and he'd only done it for one night when his parents were furious at him. He was a rebel, that boy. My own mat was in a little overgrown ravine covered in vines, and it was more a hideaway than a viewpoint. Great place to spend a quiet hour practicing guitar, but it wouldn't have been comfortable to live on, even for a day. You can see the symbolism in Dea's welcoming remark, though. This planet is truly your privilege to visit. Like your mat. I hope it makes sense to explain this sort of thing now. I don't know if this chronicle will have readers some day or not, but let's imagine for a moment that it will. People from our local area will recognize our cultural nuances right away, but I worry that any readers from other planets will feel unwelcome if I just leave them guessing. Coming to a new planet is disorienting, and no one is more aware of that than me. The explanations all interspersed in the next few pages are your mat, your welcome mat, your foothold here. Welcome to Voyaler. So I'll go on to explain that the Anopicon wasn't completely serious when he said, Our planet is your mat. He doesn't really have jurisdiction over our whole planet. Our country is just a crescent-shaped chunk, wedged between a mountain range and the planet's only known ocean. Surrounding our country on its three terrestrial flanks is the much larger semi-tribal chaos we call Padravos, or the Kadra. The technologically advanced communicators wouldn't be in any danger there, but they've never been known to visit. The same goes for the countries up the coast in either direction. We happen to be their spaceport. "'Where is our Marik?' asked one of the metalloids, and with that encouragement I stepped out of the crowd. "'You're humongous,' said the form, expanding its vertical frame by half a meter and contracting back. Ah. Nashtashtake, I said, calling him or her by the shortest version of his name he would allow. You don't need to exaggerate. I was smiling like a fool. I'd grown a couple of centimeters, I'm sure, but I was still a skinny seventeen-year-old who would have been crushed on the football fields of his old hometown. I loved these metal guys with all my heart, and I couldn't get over seeing them again, completely unexpectedly. On the other hand, you couldn't really hug them. You have no idea how good it is to see you guys again, I sighed. We came to give you a birthday present, said another metallic, my old friend Tumarahashsaha. I laughed. This had to be a joke. For one thing, the actual date of my birth, October 6th, isn't translatable into any particular day on this planet. The equivalent day I'd picked as my nominal birthday here was months away. Uh, I should explain, despite lacking a moon here, we still group tetrads of weeks into months, with an extra short month to round out the end of the year. Secondly, since I'd been in suspended animation for a very, very long time, my chronological time was completely severed from my biological time. On the day I'm describing, I was probably over 400,000 years old, but I'd only lived 17 years, more or less. Where was my true birthday back there in the faded-out mists of time? A long trip, planet to planet, Earth to quasi-Earth. Low-budget interstellar travel, with not less than 10,000 Earth years needed per light year of distance covered. Closely situated stars, often four or more light years apart. Think about it. And me spending the time as a well-insulated ice cube, 
oblivious to it all. Dea obviously thought the birthday remark was a joke, too. How can we help you, my friends? What can we get for you? No, truly, said Dashi, as I called Nashtashtsuke in my own mind. We're just making a delivery, one human, a friend for our Marik. The fact that some communicators would stick a new human down on this planet was not so unusual. The only reason this planet has a human population at all is that communicators had imported a great deal of Earth life and transplanted it here. Apparently the original biology of the planet had been gelatinous slime on shadowy parts of the surface. All that's left of that now is some slick spots and caves and the gel whales, as they're called, of the ocean, nearly featureless clear blobs that wander over volcanic hot spots in the water, living on chemicals. There had never been photosynthesis here, as far as we know, no plants, and life had not got very far. Anyways, let's move on. Okay, young man, time to come out, said Tumi, who would not let himself audibly be called anything shorter than Tumarahashsaha. He was the ship revivalist, the specialist in preserving and reviving biological life forms. The communicators themselves had once been biological, but they'd given it up for the sake of space travel. They'd had to develop a lot of biological skills to transform and transfer themselves entirely into electromechanical things. They were good at life and death. A boy came up the exit port of the lander. He blinked at the intense light of our tropical landscape. As he took his first step down the ramp, solar reflections bounced off his straight blonde hair like a laser show. Or so it seemed to me. He was neatly dressed in new blue jeans that looked as if they were straight off the rack in my old hometown on Earth. And he had a white cotton t-shirt featuring two small black stars in letters that said, Souvenir of Light Year 18.7. The boy twisted to look at something and I could see there was more written on the back of the shirt. Are we there yet? Ah, they must have had fun thinking that one up. He had running shoes with laces. Some of the kids in the crowd were pointing at them. We tended more to sandals around here. The tying up of shoelaces was a strange art. We hope you'll be so kind as to accept from us, said Nashi, a human who we couldn't bring to you last time for technical reasons. But here he is, and he is very excited to meet you. He has no other name, so we name him in our own tradition. Oh, sure. Great name. When you're sitting in space with your buds for hundreds of thousands of years, and you have nearly infinite memory capacity, by all means, have a long name. But I think humans are going to have to edit that one. Yathithis, said Dea graciously, welcome to our world, Voyalar, our country, Diana, and our national park here, Rington Beach. It's a great honor to have you here. We didn't know you were coming, but we'll find some place for you to live. If you wish, you can stay at my place, like Marik does. I arrived almost two years ago, and I'm still at his house, which is one of our country's two official palaces. He more or less became my new dad, I guess. He thought that I probably would be the only extraplanetary delivery he'd see in his lifetime, but with the royal palace at his disposal, he had room for more if they came along. The palace is nothing too fancy, but it is big. I was very surprised by this new development. There's not much you can do with a spacecraft when it's out in deep space far from an energy source, but by the time I was revived, our ship had been in the energy fields of this planet's sun for a good chunk of time. I never heard or saw anything of another human on board, and this was a remarkable human. I found him incredibly beautiful. It's hard for me to say that, to admit to admiring a boy. How did an earth boy like me come to be on a communicator ship in the first place, you might be asking yourself. Well, it all relates to that same, uh, the same shyness.